Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Global Foundries with Jamie Schaefer, who's going to talk about FDSOI, 22 nanometer, 12 nanometer, what the difference is between FDSOI and bulk CMOS, and how that's going to change as we start moving down into the uh, deep FinFET world um, of 7 nanometers, 10 nanometers versus FDSOI, which is still a planar uh, process. We've been hearing a lot about FDSOI for quite a while, and now the comparison is, do we move to FinFed? Do we stay with a planar process at 22 nanometers? What's the advantage of one versus the other? Yes, FinFed is an excellent technology if you have a design that requires the ultimate in performance and the ultimate in digital density scaling. Um, however, FinFed is not right for the vast majority of products, a large number of customers, and number of applications that are coming in from 40 nanometer or from low cost 28 nanometers technologies today. In those cases, those designers, they need a, a roadmap to lower power, uh, they need a cost efficient roadmap for analog and RF integration, and they need a path for system integration of features such as embedded non-volatile memory. And for this, a planar FDX technology is the right solution. When you're looking at FinFETs, you're trying to cut the leakage, you're trying to get some really advanced um, performance, do you lose a lot as you start moving into the FDSOI world? Yeah, FinFET is, there's no technology that can compete with FinFET in terms of raw drive current per footprint on the wafer. That's due to the 3D architecture you get in a FinFET. You have more drive current per footprint. However, FinFET, due to its 3D nature, has some limitations. It has very high parasitics and very high capacitances. And this causes actually limitations for FinFET, especially for analog and RF applications. Uh, where FinFed does not have that high of an F -max, uh, RF FMAX capability uh, compared to, say, a planar uh, FDX technology, which is excellent for millimeter wave and RF technologies. As we move into the IoT world, a lot of those markets are in, tr in flux. They're not quite defined like they were in a uh, mobile device where you had billions of units coming out. This is sort of let's test out the market, let's see how this works. This is a more cost-effective way to approach this kind of market, right? It is, it is a more cost-effective way for the IoT market. Uh, 22 FTX technology, for instance, is only 38 mask layers for an eight layer metal process. By comparison, that's 30 to 40% fewer masks than a 16, 14 nanometer generation FinFET technology. Our next generation 12 FDX technology is also about 40% fewer mass layers than a 10 nanometer FinFET technology. So it's a lot more cost efficient. It's almost a 40 nanometer mask count, uh, but being offered at an advanced 22 nanometer technology node. And the mask layers, when you start getting into the FinFET world, we're now talking at 10 nanometers of, what is it, 120 masks or somewhere around that neighborhood? Yeah, there's definitely a mass count explosion. I don't know if it's quite 120, but uh, in FinFET, you know, maybe you have close to 60 masks in a 16, 14 nanometer node. As you go to the 10 nanometer node, you're up into the 70, 70 mass count. And at seven nanometer, you're probably approaching mid 80s for your overall mass count. Um, so that's a quite large explosion of mass counts. And um, for, for low cost applications, uh, many of these applications can't migrate. They tend to be smaller die and they don't really benefit from the scaling that you get from a FinFET and they won't benefit from that extra added complexity. Um, but they still need that roadmap for lower power and FDX provides that roadmap for those applications. Why don't you draw this out so we can actually visualize it? Sure. So what are we looking at here? So this is a cross section of an FDX transistor. Um, FDX is similar to a FinFET in that you have a good electrostatic control over your channel except the fin is a 3D orientation. Uh, this remains a planar orientation, so you have the, the body, or what's called the back gate of the transistor. You have an SOI insulation layer, and then you have a thin channel material in the transistor. The gate itself is still a planar architecture, so you have a lot of flexibility over your gate length and your contacted pitch for flexible designs for maybe designing ultra-low leakage circuits. And you also have a nice planar architecture with low parasitics which helps in many of your analog and RF designs as well. And this is all single patterning, right? For the 22 FDX node, um, it is very similar to the 22 or 28 nanometer technology. 
Uh, there are only two layers of double patterning added compared to 28 in order to enable a 20% raw gate density scaling, which actually due to the higher performance in the transistor, uh, often ends up about 50% digital scaling compared to 28 um, when you do a routed PPA analysis. What's the difference on the design flow when you're working with FDSOI versus a planar chip and also a FinTech? Well, one of the most unique features of the FDX transistor is you have what is called a backgate. So you have the ability to modulate through tap cells uh, the th voltage on the backgate of the transistor that dynamically raises and lowers the threshold voltage of this transistor so you can actively lower the VT to get higher performance or lower active power, or you can raise that VT to, uh, for static leakage optimized circuits to get uh, less leakage current in your transistor. So in the past, when people worked with uh, 40 nanometers, they played around with some of the body biasing, uh, not at the level that you could do with F FDSOI. What changes? Yeah. What's different now that versus what was there before? Well, in a bulk technology, you can apply a bias to the body, but you're limited in the amount of voltage you can apply to that body due to the junction leakage or due to latch up concerns. What's unique about a fully depleted SOI technology is you have an insulating layer separating the channel from the backgate region. This allows you to apply a much wider range of voltage to the backgate and control the threshold voltage over and, thresh and leakage of this transistor over many orders of magnitude uh, to take advantage of forward body biasing to boost the performance or reverse body biasing to lower the static leakage of that particular transistor. So there are some basic advantages to doing a chip in an FDSOI process versus a CMOS process, right? What are they? Yes, so bulk technologies, bulk planar technologies are really running out of steam at the 28 nanometer node. And in a bulk technology, you have your largest source of variation is due to random dopant fluctuation in the channel. This is a fully depleted transistor, so there's no dopant in the channel. You get excellent mismatch capability between your transistors compared to a bulk technology. Um, with the SOI, you've also basically truncated your uh, depletion regions of your source and drain, and so you get much better overall leakage, you get reduced capacitance, and you get improved dibble and subthreshold slope in your transistors compared to a bulk technology. And if you're biasing with this, what do you get out of that? Uh, when you're applying biasing, there's a ways to there's there are ways to leverage the backgate biasing to get additional benefits for performance. Uh, some of those ways include applying selective biasing, so only lowering the threshold voltage of certain performance critical paths on your circuit uh, to maximize the performance without taking any leakage penalty. Uh, there are also ways through design trimming where you strictly design to the typical, typical corner without regard for any of the process variations. And after, that, after those chips come out of the factory, you can always compensate for the slow parts by accelerating those parts with the forward body bias. Um, and in doing so, in designing your chip that way, you've basically designed with fewer overall cells and you have boosted your performance to FinFET like power and performance. One issue that keeps coming up as we start marking down Moore's Law is process variation. It, what's the difference on an FDSOI process versus a bulk process? Yeah, the largest source of process variation in an advanced node bulk planar technology is random dopant fluctuation. Because this is a fully depleted technology, there's no dopants within the channel, uh, you basically eliminated the random dopant fluctuation to your overall global variation. Um, that, coupled with the improved electrostatic control of this transistor, is basically re-enabled scaling for planar, for planar technologies to more advanced nodes with the FDX technology. As we move down to 12 nanometers, which is your next node here, what does that look like versus 22? Well, 12 FDX will continue to be a planar technology uh, similar to 22 FDX. Um, it will be a full node scale, so a full node roadmap scaling from 22 FDX. Um, it will carry over a lot of the superior analog and RF characteristics, including the high FT, high F max. It will be optimized for low 1 over F noise. Uh, for analog scaling applications. And it has a lot of the same flexibility uh, for gate length control uh, to port analog designs from a more advanced nodes, 40, 28 nanometer, into the 22 and then 12 FDX nodes. So there's a lot of layout flexibility uh, for power management for adding devices such as LDMOS to the technology that you will have in 12 FDX that are really complicated to add into a FinFET-like technology. 
when you get into the FinFET world down at 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers, you're probably into quadruple or even octuple patterning. Where are we with 12 nanometer FDX? Our strategy on the FDX platform has to make it as cost efficient as possible. Many of the applications that are using this are in cost sensitive consumer, mobile, and IoT markets. Uh, we chose the 22 nanometer node instead of pushing forward to the 20 nanometer node because it avoids a lot of the costly double patterning that you begin to pick up at the 20 nanometer node. Whereas in 22, it's basically the last node of single patterning. Um, as we've marched forward to 12 FDX, our strategy has been very similar. We have stopped short of 10 nanometer, where you start to pick up costly triple and quadruple patterning, and have left that node at, an, at, at a position in terms of contact with poly pitch and back end pitch, where you can still pattern that with only double patterning. Is IP readily available for these processes? Yes, knowing that uh, FDX technology is a differentiated technology, uh, we are providing a full suite of IP through our dedicated IP service provider who is uh, Invicus. Uh, they're providing a complete suite of foundation IP, which includes libraries, uh, memory compilers, GPIOs, PLLs, as well as a complete suite of uh, complex IP uh, that spans um, power management uh, interfaces and CERTES. What are you expecting to see this in terms of production, 22 as well as 12? Well, for 22 FDX, we're prototyping now. We will be volume production ready in Q1 2017. We are on track and yields are running ahead of schedule. The 12 FDX node is going to be ready for uh, prototyping in the second half of 2018. So in terms of the companies that would be going into the FinFET uh, design versus an FD SOI design, what do they look like? What's, what will, who will go to one versus the other? So for FinFET, they're really a handful of companies who are the pure lead adopters on most advanced technologies. They have already taken the FinFET roadmap and they're going down that path because they need the highest performance for app their applications. Now most applications require lower power, but they don't necessarily fit require FinFET level performance. We're engaged with, on 22FDX, we're engaged with a large number of companies, many of the largest semiconductor companies in the world, and we have over 60 companies who are engaged in using the FDX PDK today. So are companies doing both? There are. There are many companies doing both. Um, many of these companies need FinFET for some of their applications, uh, but so for many of their other applications that require a higher level of system integration with analog and RF capabilities, they are using FDX technology. So they're potentially complementary in, in terms of the product uh, lines for the, these large companies. The roadmap is highly complementary between FinFET and FDX. Um, there is no longer one size fits all for all applications in the market today. Uh, both solutions are required. Jamie Schaefer, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for having me.